Hi, good morning, everybody. Our first talk this morning is Choose Your Own Networking Adventure, or Choose Your Own Adventure, Networking, Networking Professionals' Roads to Success. It's moderated by Kayla Clifford. Thank you, everybody, for, oh, am I on? No, All right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for attending this panel. Um, I have put this together, but I was basically going off of an idea or a talk that I saw uh, two years ago. Um, it inspired me to get this panel together of professionals to discuss their career paths. The talk that I saw was um, by Danny Rossman, and this is basically an extension of that. Um, I really feel like this is important to not just the younger generation, but people who are stuck in their careers, who aren't sure where they want to go. So I have my panelists here to explain their paths and how they got to where they are, and also to have a focus on advice for the future generation and also talk about some of the failures that they've gone through that have got them where they are today and that stand out to them. So I have my panelists here in no particular order. Uh, Chris, Jezebel, Matt, Sylvie, Marty, and Danilo. And they're all gonna be going over their, um, their career timelines for you. So thank you. Chris, take it away. Hi, um, I'm Chris Woodfield. Um, it's kind of uh, it's kind of intimidating to think about the fact that I've actually been in this business for 20 years now. Um, 21 years ago, I never would have imagined this would be my life's work, uh, but but here we are, and uh, very happy, and I feel very fulfilled in how things have gone gone for me. Um, so early days, um, I had always had a fascination with this type of technology, especially you know, going back to even the 80s dial-up BBSs. But for a long time, I always assumed that this was just things that other smart people did. Um, you know, I could never be smart enough to do that. Um, so I'll just be a happy consumer and enjoy hanging out on IRC channels and, and uh, check out Usenet groups and things along those other lines. Um, yes, remember Usenet? Um, so, um, I went to college, got a communications degree with uh, designs of being a graphic designer. Um, did that for a couple years, and that's and around that's around the time I first encountered the Netscape browser. Um, actually, no, it was the Mosaic browser, then Netscape, and saw how you know got saw books on how to design web pages, how to get on the internet, and you know. Me working on the internet is kind of like an alcoholic working behind a bar. <laughs> it was, I was just so fascinated by it. I wanted to be a, a part of this as much as I possibly could, but I had no idea how, how do I get there. Again, this is something that, you know, my mentality was, no, this is something that other smart people build. Um, I can never imagine having the skill levels needed to, to, to work on this. Um, but um, this was the same time that Linux became a thing. Um, so at some point I decided, okay, I'll start messing around. I got a secondhand PC from a friend, uh, installed one of the first Linux distros back in the days when they were sent around on floppy disks. Um, I did not have a CD-ROM drive. Um, taught myself a few things, um, enough to be dangerous. Again, nothing, nothing that made me think I could actually make this useful. Um, until I found some friends who were pretty much like-minded and did actually have jobs working at ISPs. Um, and I said, oh, maybe I should talk to them and figure out how to get my foot in the door. Um, a, few, a while later, I got my first job in the business working night shift in a knock um, at a company called Digex. Um, that was... Uh, that was fascinating, but at the same time, uh, 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 night shifts are not something I wanted to be doing <laughs> long term. Um, so uh, if you can do it, great. It did not work for me. Um, so I started looking at other opportunities, taking what I learned and going from there. Um, eventually, I wound up at a company called Internap, um, and I stayed there for 10 years, um, moving my way up from doing customer installs to uh, to eventually winding up in the architecture group. Uh, a number of my colleagues from that time are actually here in this room. <laughs> um, and, uh, and in the meantime, uh, 
uh, I relocated, um, moved to Atlanta. That, that job uh, kind of uh, went its, you know, ran its course. Um, and then I wound up uh, the happy coincidences of working on a, uh, working on an open source project that someone I had actually gone to college with uh, was one of the maintainers of. Um, happened to work at Yahoo, um, and that led to a job there, which took me to the Bay Area. Um, from there, um, I moved on to Twitter, um, stayed there for about five and a half years, uh, built that network up from something that was really only sending text to the the, uh, the vi all, all streaming, all uh, photo, all, all selfieing uh, monstrosity it is today. Um, most recently, I took a step back from operational roles um, and uh, moved to uh, Salesforce about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, now I'm actually focusing on software, which is something I had no idea I would ever have the aptitude for looking back at my time 20 years ago when I was first trying to figure out how the internet worked. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a great journey. Um, some of the things that I think I was able to do that made me successful, um, always be curious and always, always look for things, technologies on your own time. Um, don't just concentrate on the technologies and tools that you're being you're, you're, you're actively working on. Um, set, up, set yourself up a home lab. This was, this was not an easy thing to do 20 years ago. Nowadays, uh, virtually anybody can download router images. Um, there's open source routing software. Take advantage of that ecosystem. Um, because you know, the, the ability to learn networking is, you know, the technologies available that allow people to learn networking are far, far beyond what they were uh, back in, you know, back in the old days. Um, if I could do things differently, um, I would say I probably would have, uh, there are definitely times in my career where I, where I failed to do that and became complacent um, and became very heads down um, and just not assert enough on these are the technologies I want to work on, these are the things I want to learn, how do I integrate this into what I'm doing. Um, I think if I'd done a little bit more of that, I might be a little bit more, uh, more successful than I am, not that I don't think I'm not, um, but there's things to keep in mind. Um, and I think that's my time, thank you. All right, next we have uh, Danilo. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, I'm probably the most least seasoned professional up here, um, and I made my career trajectory into this area kind of randomly. Um, I, so if we take a step back and we go to college, right? Um, my parents had always like really instilled in me, become an engineer. You need to become an engineer. So I, you know, I went into college thinking I was going to become a software engineer. That's just kind of what I was going to do. And then it quickly became apparent that I was not really going to enjoy that. So I moved into uh, doing finance. And that's uh, kind of how I started um, this whole kind of trajectory of my career. I, um, I started working on the family business, doing the, the, you know, kind of the books, the accounting, whatever. And then I realized that corporate finance is probably not what I want to do either. Um, so you know, it's all learning experiences, right? I mean, that's the biggest thing for me. Um, so, you know, once I ended college and I started networking with people in my senior seminar class, um, I got in touch with someone, a recruiter from Google, who was looking for someone that had construction background with like a passion for technology. And it was a random merge of things that I had that kind of led me into getting into Google at some point. Um, you know, that job didn't work out, but I ended up doing a network um, supply chain position. Um, at Google, and I did that for a couple of years, and then, you know, again through networking and just meeting people, I uh, ended up at Facebook um, back in 2009. And for you know, doing at that time, I was doing data center asset management, um, so a little bit of network in the sense that I was kind of focused on the hardware, but absolutely not nothing to do with the network um, itself. So I uh, did that for three years, and then I went to another company, um, and you know. I think the lesson learned there for me, um, you know, 
it's a bad decision on my part in retrospect, um, but um, you know, I think the thing I learned by leaving and going to another company is that culture is dramatically important for me, um, for me to be happy at a company. Uh, so, you know, always do research on where you're going. Um, you know, different cultures drive with different people, and it really depends on kind of where you land with them. So, um, you know, I didn't stay that long at that company, and then I came back to Facebook. Um, at that point, we were now growing our the Edge Network, and they, you know, we just needed more people. So, um, you know, I reached out to a manager of the team and. And I said, hey, like, I'm interested in coming back. And he's like, look, you have a lot of the skills that we want, but you obviously don't have any experience in network whatsoever. Uh, but yeah, like, let's, let's try it out. So I've been back now for four years. Um, I am now managing the Edge Network delivery team, which is kind of a hybrid of like peering coordinator. Um, it, it basically is just extending our network deeper and deeper um, into ISPs. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the quick and dirty on, on kind of my, my career trajectory. Um, lessons learned, of, you know, throughout my very short stint is, uh, one, you know, do jobs that you may not, may or may not think are, my, like, ideal for you, uh, just based on learning opportunities. Um, you know, if I hadn't done the finance stuff, I would, probably would have never gotten into Google, and I would have never been here. Um, it just kind of all, they all uh, built on each other. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, obviously research and culture is super important. Um, it might not be to you, but for, like for me, that was a big thing. And then uh, the last thing is just networking, right? I mean, you never know who you're going to meet. Obviously, we all know that. That's what we do at these conferences. But, um, you know, making sure that you, you know, you're, you're, we actually were talking about it when we got up here. Like, your name just precedes you, right? Uh, people know of you. Uh, without ever having met you. So, um, you know, it's really important, I think, for you to just make sure that whatever you do, you, you just kind of think, think of that and, um, and just constantly network with people. You never know what kind of jobs are out there that you might be interested in later. So. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Marty to talk about his career path. All right. So those of you who, those of you who know me know uh, it's easy for me to get up on the stage and talk about technical things and finance things, but to talk about myself, I don't like to do that. But here I am, and uh, bear with me. I uh, I tried to put together a chronology that wasn't too uh, detailed. I've done a lot of things over my career. Um, I've been involved in the internet for a really long time. Uh, it started in 1985 when my mother brought home a Unix computer. She was working at uh, AT&T Bell Labs. I think it was called an S3, and she brought home 65 uh, five and a quarter inch floppies with it. And somehow I figured out to get a log how to get a login prompt, but I was never able to actually log in. I had no concept of default logins and passwords. Um, from there, uh, I tied up my house's phone line for a long time with BBSs and overnight <laughs> downloads, and uh, yep. just learned everything I could about uh, serial communications and uh, modems and things. Um, kind of fast forward, I took some notes here, I'm just kind of keep it moving. So uh, that actually had helped me to meet a guy named Michael Barrow. Michael and I, uh, Michael founded the MIT uh, Internet Special Interest Group uh, and I helped him out. Uh, I, I was the meeting coordinator and I brought in people to kind of talk to audiences about the internet and we also taught people how to use Telnet and FTP and you know, fun protocols like that that I'm sure you're all very well aware of these days. Uh, that parlayed itself into a job uh, running the NSF net node at Bose.com, which was really my, my first kind of foray into the internet. I was the, the firewall administrator and I ran a SOX proxy and uh, all the things that went along with it. Um, fast forward, 1995, my first foray into social media. I had solid, solid Unix skills, learned from my previous experience and um, some networking skills from Bose and I built upon that platform here at Firefly. Um, you all use the technology that Firefly developed. Uh, every time you see a stupid banner ad for something that you, uh, you thought about, it was because Firefly invented this kind of agents protocol. Um, uh, these little quotes are little anecdotes that I thought might personalize this a little bit. Um, this one says, Joe, you sure you guys can handle 10 megabits? That's Joe Provo. He, uh, he's, his boss sold me a 10 megabit ATM to the internet from Cambridge, Mass, which uh, at the time I was really excited about, but in retrospect, not a good fit. Uh, <laughs> but also that kind of underscores relationships and some of the relationships that I've had with people in the business has started all the way back then and, and Joe's one of those people. 
went on to be the chief engineer at TIAC, which was basically the university for BBN. Uh, you usually took a job at TIAC, you spent one or two months working in the NOC for me, and then you immediately quit and got a job at BBN. Uh, went on from there, did a few other interesting things. I, I forayed into managed services a little bit, did some security. Um, then I went on to work on SS7 technologies. Again, I think the point that I'm trying to make with my career progression is that the internet underpins many things, but it was really about uh, a little bit of ADD and the applications, and the applications of what utilizes the un underlying infrastructure. And I've been able to kind of maintain a, a, a little bit of pinball with the applications and, and, and how they work and how they affect society and the internet, but it was always underpinned by the internet. Um, I worked at a company called S, uh, XCOM, which was acquired by Level 3, and if you uh, go to the newly minted CenturyLink sign in Westminster and walk into the lobby, you can see the patent. Uh, Level 3 acquired that company, I ended up there. Um, this anecdote is uh, Brian Deardorff, and uh, we were using Ascend GRFs as uh, uh, high capacity Ethernet switches, and they didn't really work. And they, Ascend had been acquired by Cascade, and their stuff was so broken that uh, I think it was at 11 or 12 o'clock at night, Brian and I drove over to the Cascade Labs in Westboro, Massachusetts, put a Cisco 7500 in a trash bag, brought it back to our data center in Cambridge where all the kind of technology was happening and swapped them out and then hid the GRF so no one would know that we ever used it. It was very fun. <laughs> <laughs> and the GRF had a couple of acronyms. One was goes really fast and the other was gets really and you can figure it out from there. Uh, okay, so did some other interesting stuff. Again, more underpinning of the network and the applications. Landed at VaraSign through an acquisition. Um, this one was really interesting. Um, I had through my Unix and networking skills, learned about the Communications for Law Enforcement Assistance Act and got a little bit of expertise in that, basically third-party lawful surveillance. Um, I worked at Verison and I did some the merger and acquisition work for the company that they acquired that I was at and helped them build their Kalia Service Bureau, which was really, really fascinating, and I learned a lot. And I learned a new respect for law enforcement professionals and the work that they do. Um, political, political arguments aside, it's a it's a very uh, interesting thing, and um, they, do, they do a lot of great work. And uh, the anecdote here is I was on a call testing with the FBI, and I, uh, they, they answered the phone, and they said hello, and I said, is Whitey home? Uh, it wasn't funny. <laughs> 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 uh, then from there, I kind of did a few other things. I ended up, uh, I worked in the Bahamas for a couple years. My friend Chris Malater did some work with me there. Um, I ended up building a data center in Iceland for Vern Global, and uh, I landed at Akamai. This anecdote, you all may know well, morning, Mr. Gilmore, Patrick Gilmore. I worked for him for maybe five or six years and then took over the group, and uh, I think the rest is kind of history there. Um, I learned pretty much everything I know about interconnection at Akamai and under Patrick and with Christian Kaufman and Noam Friedman, and um, it was a really great experience. Went to Microsoft, did a little time there, really great shop. I love the people. Um, from there, I landed at Twitch, which is where I'm at today. Uh, another application that is underpinned by the infrastructure and really fascinating new problems. I work with some of the best engineers in the business, um, the network, the software engineers, the video guys, really fantastic and I think it's really going to drive the edge and I'm really looking forward to learning and uh, contributing and helping to solve some problems. So to get to the questions and get over with this, so uh, what would I do differently and failures and things like that? Mm, I'm not going there. Don't ever look back. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter. You learn from your mistakes and you move on. Um, and then what, 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 what advice can I give all of you? Um, admire people. I have a short list here, and nobody should turn red when I mention your name, but um, Barry and Mary Shine, they, we owe them a little debt. Uh, they're part of the reason we're all here, but I don't think many people are very familiar with them. Software Tool and Die, the world, first ISP on the planet. Uh, small debt, John Curran, uh, learned a lot from him. Sylvie, we've worked together on some fascinating stuff that um, I have a great respect for her. She's really smart and I love working with her. My friend Gabe Cole, um, Mike Barrow, Chris Malater, Patrick, of course. I miss Randy. I wish he would come back and, and stop going to the IVTF. This is better, Randy. Uh, Raz, Turkbergen, not uh, Senna, but I love Richie Senna as well. But Richard Turkbergen is a really great guy to know and he's really smart. And then obviously Nanog and all you guys. It's, uh, without the relationships and Nanog and the education and, and, the, and, the, and the mentoring that some of you folks have given to me, um, I wouldn't be up on the stage today and I really appreciate it. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you, Marty. And next we have Matt. All right. <clears throat> so um, where do I start? So my, my title is Senior Technical Network Planner, which I realize probably doesn't tell you much. I currently work at Akamai Technologies. Um, so let's fast forward through a little bit of this stuff to begin with. Um, a lot of this is about the things that I learned and the things that I learned about myself along the way. So it starts in New York City, went to college in New York City. Um, the job boards in the computer science department said, hey, we have a paid internship for J. Random Wall Street Company. Come down here, make an egregious amount of money for a starving college student and do sysadmin. So I'm like, sure, that sounds like a great idea. And so I did that. And so what followed next was four years of me holding down a part-time job while carrying a full engineering load because the work was just that interesting. And so there were a couple of different companies there. I'm not going to list all of them, but um, just doing standard issue Unix sysadmin, old school, you know, where every machine had a name and you knew each one of them by name. Um, not true anymore, but that's where we were. Um, after, after college, um, first I, I started at uh, Mindfox, which was the New York City Hacker ISP, um, and I kept the machines from being too owned on a regular basis. And, um, and that was just a lot of fun. You know, it was very much a startup atmosphere. And I got to start learning the, what do I want in a professional environment? What do I want, you know, how, what, what is relaxed, what is too relaxed? And um, just learning more about what I enjoyed in terms of work environment. Um, after that, went to PSINet Pipeline New York um, and did a lot of work there, also sysadmin. Um, but it's beginning to edge into the network side of things. And that's where the slow transition happened. Um, after I left PSINet, I was in a situation where you know, they, they eliminated their Manhattan office. Most of my friends had moved up to Boston at that point. I was looking around and someone said, hey, you know, I'm leaving BBN Planet, do you want my job? And so I said, sure. This is a lot about saying yes to, this is a continuous thing. And started in their system operations center, basically doing system support for their new fangled web hosting thingy um, that they did for a while, but also then over time getting more into the network side and analyzing the network side and more and going to tier two support for network analysis. And on top of that, finding that I really had a love for statistics. You know, taking a look at every piece of time series data you have represents a signal and signals can be processed. And teaching people, showing people how to visualize information and showing people the narrative that is behind data so that you can actually make decisions and tell a story and figure out what you're going to do next. And that is a thread that goes throughout whatever comes next. So after being at BBN for a while and then doing tools for a while at BBN as well, um, where I found out that while <clears throat> I am pretty good at coding, I am not actually a software engineer, I went to a startup, which we're not going to talk about much besides the fact that this is where I learned that there are, certain, there are certain work environments that are so bad for you that it's not worth the money in general. Um, there, 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 there are situations like, did you hold on for the IPO? Yes, I hold on for the IPO and then got out as quickly as possible. Um, because it was just when you dread coming to work every day, only so much money will compensate for that. So after I left there, um, this fellow by the name of Avi Friedman, who I'm sure a few of you know, um, um, said, hey, there's this company called Akamai, and we need networking people. Are you interested? I said, yes, sure, why not? And so that starts, that was 2000 to 2002. And being at Akamai was a fascinating thing and wonderful network architecture. And, you know, when the Juniper M20s get rolled in on the cargo pallet right next to your cube, you take the cap off, you plug in the serial cable, you configure it, put the cap back on, and roll it out the door. Repeat a lot. Um, and just getting things going and moving fast was kind of amazing. Um, then the dot-com bust happened. Um, Akamai lost two-thirds of, two of its people, including me. And I went to Tufts University for a while. And I did that edge there and got to basically rebuild the network from a layer two core to a layer three core. And that was where I really got deep, hardcore into network engineering, where it was effectively my network. And it affected thousands of students across eastern Massachusetts and really having the responsibility if things went wrong and working with an amazing team. And so it was, it was a really, really great experience all around. And somewhere in there I got, I got to do a master's degree because it turns out that universities will pay you in product. 
Um, this is also, so one thing that's on here is, hi, my name is Matt Ringle, and I'm a recovering wedding photographer. Um, one of the things that I did um, during that time was I did wedding photography. I do a lot of photography in general. This seemed like a reasonable way to, uh, to, to, to monetize the toys. And the big thing I learned there is contracts. Every customer I gave, every customer I had, I gave a contract to. And understanding what a contract actually meant and understanding what those negotiations actually meant was gigantic. Under, understanding how to feel out a customer, what's going on. After all that, came back to Akamai, first on the revenue side, professional services. Um, built a web performance consulting group, offering contracts again. Learning sales, learning how to sell ideas to people. Um, after a whole bunch of time doing that, which was amazing, went back to engineering, first in network architecture with uh, this fellow by the name of Martin Hannigan as my boss. And then um, after doing that for a couple of years, going to network planning, and now I'm in position, all of my positions have been influenced without authority, you know, where nobody reports to me, but a lot of people listen to me. And so this is more about understanding how to get ideas into people's heads and making them understand what's going on and then being able to do the research necessary combined with statistics and data and selling ideas to actually get to a, co a coherent strategy that everybody buys into for how we're gonna deploy in, let's say, the Americas. Um, and that's kind of where, there's no way to study for deployment strategy for the Americas for the largest CDN in the world. It's a culmination of all these things that come together. Um, in, in finality, I think the, the advice that I would give, I'm actually going to read this one out because I wrote it out. Be a student of your profession. This sounds a lot like what Chris said. Never, never forget what it means to sit down and study. Consciously spend time learning more, finding out more about the corners of your field that aren't necessarily in front of you at your job. One of the biggest mistakes you can make is falling into the groove of thinking that the things you do for your job is the extent of what you need to know. There's a big difference between 10 years of experience and two years of experience repeated five times. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you, Matt. And next we have Sylvie. All right. So it just made me realize that uh, my tenure in this industry is now 25 years this year. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I started um, during, I, I, came, I came to the industry via the business side. Uh, when I was in high school, I came across this program that was called Junior Achievement, where you start your own company for six months, mm. and at the end, you need to fold it and, um, and close it. Um, and it was an all-girl company. And we did what? We did boxer shorts for men. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we won company. I knew you were interesting. <laughs> and we won company of the year for Canada, and that was a really cool experience. Um, and it, it showed me the, the power of working together towards a common goal. Um, and uh, it also swifted my, my study path into more the business side. So I went to the business school, but I didn't, I didn't want to let go of the um, technical side, so I did IT, um, so information systems, and uh, specializing in uh, market research and quantitative analysis, and I think that was, a, that was a good mix for me. And then I landed my first job, actually thanks to Junior Achievement, I landed my first job at the Laurentian Group, which was a financial group. Um, and they, they basically hired, I didn't know this, but they hired grads from Junior Achievement and they kind of gave you an internship for the summertime. So I learned a ton there. I was rotating two or three weeks through different departments. So I, I, it was a really good experience to get acquainted to all corners of the business of financial services. Um, and then um, I, I had paid for my studies and I was antsy to travel and I didn't know where I wanted to go so I really picked the other end of the world as my destination, and I went to Australia. And meanwhile, I retained my job at the Laurentian Group. My boss was super great, and he said, look, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. Take some time off, we'll wait for you. Take three months, six months, eight months, whatever you want, we'll wait for you. So it was really great that I could do that travel and come back to something, because I'm a little insecure financially. So. 
So that was a good, um, a good um, trip, so we went backpacking. And throughout the backpacking, then I started realizing that we were quite far away and that communications were really, really hard to come by. Um, I, could not, I have three children now and they're young adults and I could not fathom being one connection away from them. Over there in 1993 when I was backpacking, I called my parents maybe once every 10 days when we got a phone booth. That's all we could get. Uh, so it just shows you how far we've come in, in, 90, in since 93 to now, like we're just one WhatsApp away. So, uh, And then I um, had a great opportunity. To, my mentor at the Laurentian Group became the CEO of Teleglobe. And Teleglobe used to be the crown corporation for overseas telecommunications. And he said, we're no longer a crown corporation. We need new people. We need new ways of thinking. Why don't you come over for an interview? And I got a job there, and I started. I was the only one that had the IT background, so I started on the digital communication side because that's something that I understood. It was zeros and ones. It was like, oh, I get that. That's fine. And this is where I finally met basically submarine cables, satellites, and the internet. Uh, and I, be, I came at it from being the first product manager, created the Backbone 6453, which if you know me, you, say, you know that I call this my firstborn. And it truly is my firstborn. Um, and it, it's been a really, really amazing trip. So just uh, creating this Backbone and growing it. Then I went to mobile communications because I thought I needed to learn something else, and mobile was booming. I don't know if you remember, we had these really big phones, like, like this. Um, and it was the GSM start, so I was part of that. It was also a great learning experience. Uh, and then I came back to Teleglobe, which was acquired by VSNL Tata Communications. And what happened there was a bit magical, because I came to my first NANOG in 2003. And I met all of you guys. I have to say that you were really, really scary at first. <laughs> like, I was extremely intimidated. And I thought, wow, like, these people come to the mics. Like, this is 2003, we've changed a lot. And people were shouting at each other. <laughs> and they were basically, I think discussing violently different points of view. And I thought, oh, well, that's not the carrier world. Like, we're very much gentlemanly and more mild manners. Like, we'll, we'll disagree, but we're not going to fling insults. Um, so, so that, I, it was a little hard for me. And at the time, there was only 7% women. And, um, I remember Sue Harris saying that she was giving the stats from the conference and she was so happy that there was 7% women. I'm like, wow, okay, where am I? What's going on? Um, but I stuck around. I saw it as a challenge. I said, this, the, the world is not 7% women. We need more. This internet, I believe in it. And I started getting really involved with NANOC. So I started with the program committee, um, and then the steering committee, and then the, what became NUNOG. So I was uh, on, the, on the board of the first NUNOG. And it's been tremendous. And I did this because I truly believed that I could have an impact and I could, I had a voice. I had something to say. And it was an interesting crowd to do this from. Um, the internet, what fascinates, still, uh, what fascinates me still today is that we're all competing, but we're all collaborating. And it wouldn't work any other way. And I think that if we put a good effort in collaborating, we can self-regulate and we can make really, truly grand things. And we're, to, to a really large extent, we're doing that really well, so that's great. Um, and also being, then being part, a bit like you, being part of the, the crowd here, um, I got a call from Google who said, would you like to come and join our infrastructure group? 
Um, and at first I thought, huh, content company? I don't know. I don't know that I want to do that. Um, and then I went for the interview and then I thought, you know what? I will say yes because I know nothing about content distribution and I know the backbone. So yes, this is my next thing. Um, the lesson learned for me is that whenever you get a little comfortable, a little too, this, I, know, I know this, I know the four corners of my garden, but probably it's time to move on. It's time to learn something new. Um, and that's been a recurring theme and I didn't quite understand what I was going through, but now with perspective, I can tell you that if I feel too comfortable, it's time to move on, I need to learn something new. So that's something that I would really wish someone told me earlier because I would have taken bigger risks. And that's the other thing I'd like to tell you is take risks. Risks are fun. Um, risks are, help, are there to help you grow. And if you skin your knees, it's quite okay. You can stand up again and pick it up. But like you said, Marty, you don't learn from your success. You do learn from your mistakes. So it's, it's really important to, um, to learn from uh, your mistakes. Um, an important thing for me that I do want to talk about is coming to Nanog and, and getting involved with Nanog. I did suffer from a condition that I had no idea what it was called until I realized it was called the imposter syndrome. I really felt I did not belong here that everyone around me was much smarter than me. They could, all, they could all do this a ton better than me. And it was really, really uncomfortable. Um, but I only learned that it was called imposter syndrome maybe five years ago. Um, so if you're feeling that everyone around you is more smart and can do this a ton better, look that up. You might have that condition too. Um, but you know what? You can cure it. You can, you can gain in, in confidence and you can definitely do great things. The only barrier to your success oftentimes is you. So that's, I will leave you on that. Okay, thank you, Sylvie. Um, for the sake of time, we're, we were going to have questions uh, for the audience, but we're going to go ahead and go, let Jezebel speak. Um, Jezebel actually stepped in. Uh, we had another panelist who was sick and wasn't able to make it. So she stepped in at the last minute to take over for her, and we really appreciate that. So Jezebel, take it away. <laughs> so <clears throat> sorry, I don't have a slide. Uh, I just stepped in yesterday, but I promised to put one in. And so you can go through. Um, my uh, career path in this industry as well. Unlike everybody else, um, I actually studied art in university. And I had a, a different vision. I saw things differently than what I thought most people saw. So I expressed myself in painting and sculptures. It had nothing to do with infrastructure or technology. Um, but it turns out they're actually quite closely related. When I got out of college, I realized I have to make a living. You can't support yourself if you are not willing to sell art, which I was not willing to part from my art. Uh, so I went to work for a law firm. The law firm specialized in contract law, uh, intellectual property, and immigration in the Silicon Valley. And we worked a lot with startup companies and I found that fascinating, that there were so many opportunities. And, and so let me back up for a quick second. I was born and raised in China. So all the opportunities here just seemed incredible to me. You can do anything you want um, if you invest yourself to it. So one of the people at the firm, at the clients of the firm, was AboveNet Communications. And when I was getting ready, as Sylvie said, if you get too comfortable in your environment, it's time to leave. I realized I was getting too comfortable in the law firm, um, and I didn't want to become a lawyer. I, I realized that early on. That's just not the kind of person that I am. Um, but as the office manager for the law firm, 
I had to deal with telecom for the whole office, such as soup trunking for all of the phone lines and internet connectivity um, for the office. I was working through on the phone with call support with, to get those things turned up. The CEO of AboveNet was coming into the office and he was sitting in the lobby waiting and he heard me on the phone with the technician on the other end of the call saying, you handle that quite well. What are you going to be doing? What are you doing? I hear you're looking to leave the firm. What are you going to be doing? I said, I don't know, but this is not for me. I want to do something new and I want to try something new. He said, well, I started this new company called AboveNet and do you want to come and give it a try? I was like, what do you guys do? He said, oh, we're a co-location and network company. I had no idea what co-location meant. So I was like, he said, it's a carrier hotel. And I said, is that like a hotel? He said, no, no, it's for machines, you know, information exchange, the internet. And I, I thought, what could be the harm? You know, this is, let me give it a try. So I went and what I loved about art is that it's ever evolving. So at AboveNet, I wanted to learn about everything that there is to know. And you can bet that everyone in the company, all of the engineers, welcomed me with open arms. They, they said, you want to learn this? Sure, let me set up a couple of pieces of equipment, get you a login so you can play around. You have any questions? Ask us anytime. You're interested in learning. This is how we learned. This is how we can help you learn. So I built a lot of friends, and I see you guys in the audience. And I, I know that I can't be here without you guys. And so if you are starting your career in this industry, rely on your friends and this community, because this is one of the most supportive communities uh, there is. So just like Matt, uh, Avi, was my VP of engineering at AboveNet, and he asked me, hey, I'm going to this new company called Akamai Technologies, and uh, they're doing some incredible innovative technology. Do you want to come and work for us here in Cambridge, Massachusetts? I was like, I hate snow. <laughs> uh, no, not really, I don't, want, I don't want to move. He said, how about if you fly out and meet some of the people and see where a CDN? I was like, what's a CDN? And that was in 2000. So I, I went to interview and I met some of the smartest people in my life. And before I left, I said, you know what? Where do I sign up? I don't care what you pay me, what I'll be doing. I want to work with these smart people. I'm curious in learning all the things that you are doing and how you're gonna be changing the world. So I was at Akamai uh, for a few years. Just like Matt, um, the dot bomb happened. We went through some really tough times. And in the second to the last round of layoffs, I left Akamai. Well, I have all this knowledge in infrastructure and <clears throat> technology telecom. And I, where am I going to go? Well, State Street, one of the biggest banks, was hiring. So I thought, <laughs> I said, oh, I, I can work in your procurement team. I, they said, well, we need someone to lead a procurement team that's with an innovative methodology of thinking. So I, I said, well, I can do that. And I even know contracts. So I went to work for them. Um, I learned a lot from that. And I will come back to that on the lesson I learned from my career. I, let them, I was one of the youngest um, VPs that they've ever had. Um, I led a pretty big team, and everyone on my team was older than me. Um, I worked till 11.45 on New Year's Eve, so we can close a mainframe contract with IBM. And, and I'll just say that I will never go back to work for a bank uh, again. <laughs> so, um, from there, I went to a few other startups. I realized that uh, my passion and my drive uh, is truly with trying to change the world and doing something new and different. So I went to um, a startup that made 
interactive LED panels. Um, I help a friend start a company called IX Reach. Um, I left them to work with another friend at NLayer and then went to sold to GTT. Um, and three years ago, we started a new company called Packet Fabric. In, so this is just quickly going through what I've done in the industry. And I, I know that there's another session coming up, so I'm gonna just be brief. The lesson that I've learned from all of these experiences is truly believe in your vision, be curious, because technology is an ever-evolving thing. And don't ever think that you've learned everything there is to know about something, because there's always something new and someone knows something better than you. But just because of that doesn't mean that you shouldn't believe in your abilities. Because as individuals, we can all change the world. And lastly, trust in your herd. So I think on my way here, I said I'm paying homage to my nerd herd. And believe in your tribe, in your village. This is my village. This is, this is the reason why that I can be successful and we all can be successful. That's why I stepped in to help out because this is your support group. If you need to learn something, know something, have questions, you want to start a new company, ask your community and they're there to help you. And they are willing to give you the most honest and brutal feedback sometimes you don't want to hear about, but the best friends give you the tough, toughest advice and give you the truth. So. Thank me. you so much, Isabel. All right, that's the end of our presentation. Um, we'll, if, you, if you wanted to ask any questions to any of these people, they're always available walking around the hallways. Just feel free to come up, you know, ask them for advice. Um, thank you, everyone, so much. <laughs>